a lecture. Very importantly, how to start a lecture. And again, as importantly, about the preparation and planning of a lecture, the delivery itself, and how to make lectures more interesting and innovative. And then finally, we will have some time for questions and maybe you can share with me and the others some of your experiences and we can share some gray areas and discuss them after this because the presentation itself, believe me, is not going to be too long. So let's look at what, how the word lecture originated. Uh, it originated as way back in the 14th century where it was thought to be something that which is read. So that is what I'm trying to tell you not to do in this presentation. Don't read your lectures. Uh, don't sound as if you're reading to your audience. That is something we mustn't do. But that is the actual meaning of the term lecture is to read. But it has changed over a period of time. And in the 16th century, they, they used the definition that it was an oral discourse where people were given information, the audience was provided with information. Again, that is also not quite enough because as you can see, there are many purposes in giving a lecture. It's not only to transmit your information, it can be a lecture to motivate, to clarify, uh, to review, to expand the knowledge of people, and sometimes all of these things. So you can see it's not merely about transmitting information, right? If you look at the structure of a lecture, basically in very few words, the structure of a lecture should be to say what you're going to say, to say it, and say what you've said. Those three things are important. Now I have already told you what I'm going to say because in the first or the second slide, I gave you an outline of my lecture. Now I'm actually saying it. So I'm in the body part of the lecture. The introduction is over, right? So I'm now telling you what I'm planning to say. At the end, the last slide or the slide before the last would be the key points or the take home message which would be what I'm going to summarize by saying what I said. So those three things are very important to have in your lecture, whatever your lecture is. The other very important thing is to how to start a lecture. When you are starting, as we say, first impressions are very important. So you have to start very strong and you have to end the lecture also very strong. In between also you have to be, but those are the two important things that your audience will remember about you. So there are three or four ways you can start a lecture. You can start by the usual things, saying who, introducing yourself and thanking the organizers and all that. But uh, you can have a few innovative ways of starting your lecture. You can put a question to the audience, something that will stimulate your audience to think. Because you are a chemical pathologist, you can like start off, say, perhaps, say how important is doing a lipid profile to patients, how clinically relevant it, is it, or something like that. Or you can give a fact, which is sometimes startling. Or the most interesting way of starting a lecture is based on a story. Why I say that is because we were all brought up with stories. From the time we were children, we were told once upon a time. Erase unave is once upon a time. And we love stories. So it would be lovely if you can start your lecture with the actual patient or some story, which will make the audience, make the uh, participants sit up and listen to your lecture. So maybe that is why I started with this saying what we already know about lectures, that it's not a very good effective method of communicating. It's not a good effective teaching learning material. And 
asking you why you're here then, right? So something innovative you can use at the beginning of your lecture. The next step is planning your lecture. Now, planning is very important. You must sit down and take time to answer four questions before you actually start writing out your lecture, either in PowerPoint or transparencies or whatever it is. Just ask yourself four questions. That is who, why, how, what, right? Who is your audience? Now, I, I asked this from uh, Dr. Roshita several times. He's the one who coordinated this lecture. I asked him, uh, who is the audience? And he told me, well, there are trainers and maybe even postgraduate trainees who get involved in teaching. And that is why they're fairly young and inexperienced. That is why we would like this lecture given. The purpose of this lecture, as again, as I told you, I asked from him and found out the purpose of the lecture. So in that sense, the purpose of the lecture can be to give general information uh, about lecturing, which I did to some extent, and most importantly, to teach you or improve on your skill of lecturing. So with those facts, and of course the time available, even if there was a whole day available, I'm not going to lecture for more than uh, 45 minutes here. I don't like to do lectures for more than one hour anyway. Shorter the better, right? You have to say what you're saying as fast as possible and get out because concentration span of most people are very short. And then of course, what is the subject matter? Again, uh, you have to identify what your subject matter is, especially if you're given a large area, unlike this lecture, a large area, you have to decide on the key points that you're going to concentrate on. So those key points shouldn't be more than three or five key points, uh, because even if you're given a broad topic, you must understand these are the important points that I have to convey to my students. Therefore, I'm going to only concentrate on those. It doesn't matter. I don't have to teach them everything I know about lipids, everything I know about electrolytes. I think these are important for them, so I will concentrate on them. That is the kind of attitude you have to develop. You don't sit down and read one whole chapter and summarize it and try to teach all that to your students. You are people who have worked in the field for some time, so you know what is important. And therefore you concentrate on those important facts, so those aspects only. So you start with a skeleton outline. You put down these three or four points and then under those you start identifying what are the things that I have to speak under these important points. And of course, I don't have to tell you that, especially because you are going to be lecturing to postgraduate students. You have to research your subject thoroughly. Don't stick to one textbook or one or two textbooks. Read the current articles, the current thinking on those things, because you want to give that information as well. And then while you're reading these uh, research papers as well as textbooks, you add these under the three or five key points or the sub points. And also another interesting little thing that you can you know, uh, take on board is to add little trivia stories, cases in between for what I call the accordion effect. Now, uh, you must be wondering what I'm talking about. You know that the accordion can be pulled and uh, put back to shape very easily. So similarly, if you have a little extra tidbits in your presentation, when you find that you're running out of time, you can drop those. Or if you think you have a lot of time, you can keep those in. So it's always gives you a little bit of flexibility in your lecture, because if you're running out of time, you can definitely skip those slides and go on. And then after that, of course, we are almost 100% on 
PowerPoint. So you prepare your PowerPoint slides. Hardly anybody prepares a transparency these days, isn't it? Uh, when you're doing your PowerPoints, just a few things for you to remember. I'm sure you know some of these things, but just to re-emphasize those, please do not overload your slide with too much text. Even this text in my slide may be a little too much. Just keep it to about four or five points per slide. That is better, right? And try to put one thought or one idea into one uh, one slide. Don't put too many ideas into the slide because your audience find it, finds it difficult to keep up. Try to use things other than text like graphs, diagrams, pictures, especially in chemical pathology, you can use like uh, algorithms and diagrams and uh, flow charts kind of thing. Uh, again, keep your background and font simple don't use too many animations. I know we think if we animate our slides, it's very nice where you get text coming in from uh, above the slide, below the slide, sideways, you know, uh, whirling, fading, all those things. It's very distracting for the audience. So it may look impressive, it is distracting. It takes away from the important things like the facts you have to convey, the, the ideas that you have to get through. Uh, ensure that you use readable text formats and uh, don't use this gothic and things as a, perhaps as a start you can, but not over the entire thing um, and have a flow of thought so that you don't bring in ideas here and there. Your slides flow from one slide to another. Sometimes you can use what we call milestones, where the key that, you know, you started off with about three or five important uh, points. So, so those, each time you start a point, you can have like a subheading or some kind of new picture or something to show that you have finished one point and you're going to the next point. Sometimes you can have them repeating uh, as slides to show that you're on the third or the fourth point or whatever. And when you're rehearsing or when you're actually planning your slides, remember that one slide takes about one minute to con finish. So if you have like, you suddenly have for a one hour lecture about 80, 90 slides, you're obviously going to run out of time. So make sure that you have a rough idea that it's one minute per slide. So now you have prepared your slides. You don't just take that and go and do your delivery or your presentation. You have to rehearse. There's no question about it. However, uh, however experienced you get in this, you have to reverse rehearse and you can use a mirror, you can use a friend, you can use your family members, preferably somebody who can give you some feedback would be useful, but if not, even a mirror, rehearse, 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 then you can check on your timing. Don't ever go overboard with your timing because uh, that's kind of unpardonable because that shows you haven't prepared your lecture properly. Don't start your lecture by saying, I had a lot to cover, so I don't think how I'm going to cover. If you can't cover, then you shouldn't be there. So don't use those things. I have heard many lecturers saying, this is a huge and very comprehensive topic. I can't cover it. Then you should have told the organizers, very sorry, I will only deal with this aspect, okay? Right, and then on that particular day, uh, your delivery or your presentation has to be of a certain standard with your preparation, then you know your slides, you know how much time you're taking and you know how much, how you can pace yourself. Uh, appearances are important. Don't underdress or overdress. Uh, I know a lot of people don't take much care much about how they look, but it is important. You have to look the part of a 
a senior person lecturing, a person with authority, because otherwise the people have no confidence in listening to you. Your posture is important. Stand straight, don't slouch. Uh, you shouldn't have odd mannerisms like scratching your head or saying uh, all the time or whatever, because that again is distracting. As students, I remember we had a teacher who said, uh, what she was talking about. So uh, try and get rid of certain mannerisms. Gestures also, I'm of course used to using my hands as you can see, but try and not to wave your hands around too much or to uh, have that kind of unnecessary mannerisms. The tone and the volume shouldn't be monotonous. That will put people to sleep. But on the other hand, you shouldn't be too theoretical, uh, but have a variation in your tone and volume. Vocabulary, again, is important, but know your audience. Don't try to use vocabulary that is, uh, uh, that is uh, too highfalutin, where the audience can't understand what you're saying, right? So know your audience and uh, use the vocabulary accordingly. Again, when you're delivering a lecture, don't rely too much on PowerPoint, especially if your presentation is there, don't keep turning to your presentation so that you forget your audience. That's quite bad because you have to keep eye contact with the audience, which I can't do here because we are on Zoom. Uh, that's something I really miss because eye contact is very useful for several things. You contact with the audience and you can, you know, identify whether you're, they are with you or not. Now, at this moment, I don't know whether you have kept your screens on and uh, you've joined Zoom and you have gone on, uh, gone to do something else even. And that is very disheartening because uh, at times, if I feel that my audience is drifting away, I can crack a joke or do something to bring them back to me, which I can't do on Zoom. And that is quite frustrating. Sometimes you can give handouts uh, before your presentation. Various lecturers have various ideas about it. Some people think that is distracting because students keep... Uh, reading the, the handouts and not listening to you, which to some extent I agree. Uh, but on the other hand, they know what you're going to talk about. So it may be easier for them to follow your lecture, especially if it's a tough lecture. Uh, when you're talking, try to talk with passion, create the experience with words so that you interact with your audience. As I said, create a story, try to use clinical or relevant examples so that you make your lecture more meaningful. And when you're giving anecdotes or jokes or some story, it has to be relevant to your uh, audience. Like you have to know the ages of your audience, general interest, because if it's something you're talking about is something that they don't know, they will not really enjoy it. It will just go over their head, right? And also pace yourself. Don't go too fast. Don't drag the lecture by repeating things too much. But, you know, you, that again, it's very easy if you have the participation, if you can see the face, if you can watch your audience, you know, whether you're doing it right or not on Zoom, you will never know that is fine. And then at the end of the day, you don't just go back happily, uh, but you have to get some feedback. Otherwise, you never improve yourself. So as I, as this quite rightly puts, the more I lecture, the less I know if they understand. But in order to prevent that, one of the ways is you look at your audience, you see whether they were attentive to you during your lecture. 
right? Or whether they were bored like this girl and half asleep. The next thing that you can do is get feedback from your students, your participants. Uh, one of the things is by the amount of questions they ask or the statements they make, you know, they have actively engaged with you. Or unofficially, somebody might walk up to you and say, I really enjoyed that lecture, or that was a good lecture. So that is unofficial feedback. But as teachers, perhaps we can actually try and get formal feedback by giving them a feedback form where we can check out things like, was the content clearly uh, transmitted to you during the lecture? Was it adequate? Was the presentation style good enough? The PowerPoint slides, were they clear? Uh, was it understood? What space of lecture too fast or too slow? So specific things like that, you can get feedback rather than just the overall, yes, you were good. Then you can see where you're going wrong and maybe improve yourself later on. Uh, now, uh, this is, we were talking about a very straightforward, very um, normal, formal kind of traditional lecture. We said we can use anecdotes, we can use stories to liven the lecture up, and we can invite interactions or questions in the, between the lecture where you can build on those questions and answer them and then transmit the information you want. Or you can, you can actually project certain questions that will make the students think. Uh, that is another way of making them awake and alive. We also have what we call the flip classroom concept, where you give a handout or where you give certain material out for the students to read and come back. And then you base your lecture on what they already know by giving them questions and asking them questions so that it's a more interactive type of a lecture, though it's not a traditional lecture. You can also have like little topics that you can get your students to discuss in small groups, which we call bus groups. And then the lecturer can go on giving the lecture and ask each bus group what they came up with when they come to the relevant point in the lecture. You can punctuate your lecture with questions, photographs, stories, trivia, right? Of course, I find photographs sometimes distracting when they're not relevant. Some people put photographs of dogs and flowers, so I love them both. Uh, it makes you forget what they were actually talking about. So that you have to use a little sparingly perhaps, but these are some of the methods you can make a lecture interesting, especially if you're giving lectures to postgraduate students and a relatively small group, less than 30 or so. You can make it like a more discussion, a flip classroom, or bus groups kind of uh, uh, concept rather than just talking and giving information in a very monotonous tone throughout a one hour period, right? So take home messages, uh, though lectures are not great teaching learning tools, they are here with us to say, stay, and that is one of the tools we will use for a long time to come. We will modify them, we will use innovative methods, but we still have to use lectures to teach people. So as I said, now the structure of a lecture is that in the introduction, we say what we are going to say, then we say it, and then we say what we have said. So that is exactly what I'm doing now. I'm telling you what I have said over the last couple of minutes. Um, this is my take home message to you. Uh, another important thing I have to reiterate is that a good lecture requires a lot of preparation and planning and your delivery techniques have to improve with practice. 
nothing other than practice. Up to date, I still practice a lecture. I have given 10, 15 times even. I spend even 15, 20 minutes going through the slides and quickly uh, recapitulating what I've said, what I have to say before going in for the lecture. And of course, a lecture is not all over the minute you've given the lecture. You have to get some feedback. So this is time for my feedback. And therefore, I'm opening this for questions from all of you. So if I get more questions, I know my lecture has been listened to and internalized to some extent. Thank you. Yes, I have finished, but is there anything that you would like to add or this thing? I'm very welcome to answer any questions, but more uh, yeah, questions. And is there anything like you would like to share as to the problems you have when you make lectures or something? Maybe we can together decide how best to approach those. Uh, thank you, Madam. Uh, I'm Kisali, uh, the uh, current yes, Kisali. PSL uh, president. Anyway, thank you, Madam. I think uh, we are from anyway uh, from your lecture. I think uh, uh, most of our junior consultants uh, and even the trainees. Uh, we are planning to do many uh, lectures and many webinars uh, during this year. I think uh, they will. Uh, gather uh, many things uh, just to how to do a simple lecture. I think it is very informative. Uh, and I, I hope uh, others also just How can I ask the, the yes, participants? Yes. How many of you use um, uh, this format, like where you have a, uh, have a basically an introduction or an outline to your lecture, the body and a conclusion? Madam, this is Gaya. Yes, Gaya. Madam, usually, like, my practice is, I normally don't give, like, outline at the beginning. I don't think it's a good thing, but usually I start the lecture, and as, as it goes on, like, the audience has to think what's going on. But uh, usually, mainly, I do lectures to postgraduate trainees, and then... It won't be so. That is how I have practiced, but I think in the future I will like uh, follow you. <laughs> no, you, you don't really have to. If anything that works for you works well, I guess. But it's always useful to tell everybody what you're going to say. So they have a then they have like a roadmap on what how it's going to happen. Because one thing that happens is however good a lecture you are and however good a student uh, your audience would be, a human mind is such that it distracts, like wanders. Yeah. So sometimes if it wanders out and comes back and then you suddenly find, you wonder where you are with the, the lecture is going on happily. Uh, so if you have a sort of a roadmap, you know, uh, uh, they, I missed this point, but I'm still somewhere there kind of thing. Yes, madam, it's really useful. And That's why are... using milestones also is useful where you punctuate your lecture with the key points. If you put something like a, a subheading with a picture or something and say, okay, now we've discussed uh, 
how to start a lecture. The next one is planning a lecture. And then when you finish, okay, let's talk about delivery. Like then you have like uh, three or four milestones around along the way to follow. But something I find very, very useful is when you use like examples from real life, like yes, for you all, you all can actually cases. use clinical cases. Yes, madam. And the other thing is, we have a long lectures for postgraduate trainees, especially in chemical pathology for two hours. But uh, I think we have to like, rethink about that and make the lectures really short and you deliver only the salient points. Yes. One uh, would be, I think 45 minutes would be ideal. Maybe you can think of, you know, uh, I mean, I'm not finding fault at the beginning. Let me tell you as a very my first lecture was basically a, a summary of, uh, I think I had to do acute inflammation, summary of the robins and uh, put in a OHP, so transparency. I went and read that. And because I didn't make too many um, R's and R's, I thought my lecture was good. It was only the delivery I was worried about, but the content was basically a short summary of the entire chapter. So that is, you have to identify what am I going to leave these students with at the end of the day. Not the entire syllabus on lipids or electrolytes or whatever you're talking about, but some key points that they have to concentrate on. And if, if, if there is too much and you still think it's important, you can leave them with an assignment or give them yes, things to read about or, or request the organizers to have a separate lecture because you can't do that. But don't give overload them with information. That doesn't get you anywhere, basically. Anybody else wants to share? their experience as lecturers. I'm sure there were problems you faced with when you were lecturing. Madam, I'm Saman here. Yes, Saman. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, you know, when the, when the lecture is too much, you know, too overloaded, uh, the, the take home message doesn't go uh, really in. But what I feel is this, uh, our students, take this, these slides as their lecture notes, and then they try to uh, go through it again, use it again, and then somehow or other, they recall uh, what we have discussed, and then somehow or other, they, they gain that knowledge, uh, uh, not at that point itself. So in that case, I, I wonder whether it is uh, really, uh, really appropriate to uh, make them short, you know, because, because our our students needs to gather information as well, so they try to gather information in in the form of lectures rather than uh, going through the reading material. You know, reading the recommended textbooks. Uh, so, but some of them uh, are smart enough to go to the internet and you know other information sources and gather their information. But uh, most still, I see most of our students. Uh, largely depend on our lectures like, and, and use these slides as their lecture notes uh, to build up their knowledge on, as a, you know, they use this as a skeletal and build up their knowledge on that. Uh, so it, there's a controversy. I, I think it depends on the area. Um, uh, Someone area that, that, that is where not. you as a teacher has to step in quite strongly. You know, these uh, PowerPoint slides, should never, never be lecture notes. They uh, are prompts for the lecturer to lecture on. If you try to put everything that you're going to lecture on into the PowerPoint notes, one thing is they, they will become overcrowded and distracting. And the other thing is uh, it's meaningless. 
that's why I said like uh, you the the if you that in that sense what you can do is give them a written handout prior to that and then expand on that right but again now that is the sad fact if postgraduates are going to rely on your powerpoint slides as they are uh, their theory notes but that is never going to be adequate no? so that that culture that tradition has to be broken and you have to make ensure that you uh, you motivate them to read outside these notes that you're giving to, as you say, go to the internet or read journal articles or something. And that is why perhaps you can like uh, give them, uh, instead of having a series of lectures one after another, perhaps you have, it, call it a discussion or something, where you give them a question or an area to research in and get them to present or get them to start a discussion, something like that. So that that is also given some weightage. Otherwise, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, very, very disappointing if they were going to just, I mean, medical students do that, I know, uh, but I haven't come across very many histopathologists relying on the notes uh, because we ensure that when they get a slide, which is controversial, that they read everything possible. So they are fairly well-versed and we make sure that they, they don't uh, rely on just one textbook kind of thing. So that I think is something that the trainers have to address that the culture of uh, researching topics, especially the new ones, new techniques and all that has to come in. PowerPoint uh, slides are not uh, adequate, uh, what shall I say, uh, 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 a good enough uh, uh, learning tool. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's madam. Not good enough at all. And we mustn't fall into the trap of saying, oh, they are relying on these notes, so we must make a huge thing. Because then they know there is enough in that note to read and get away with. We must mm -hmm. ensure that the notes are brief so they will have to read from somewhere to fill those gaps in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, madam. Okay. Janaki? Yes. Yeah, can I? I'm Dr. Chandrika Nigama. Uh, yes, Chandrika. First of, all, first of all, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, and uh, the thing is, I was listening to it. It, it was like uh, you would have had it uh, much earlier than this. We thought, I thought uh, this uh, lecture because, like, uh, uh, we are doing lectures as well as uh, presentations in like in ac annual academic sessions and other forums. And uh, what I want to know is now you uh, explain how we should uh, get about like for the lecture, prepare for a lecture. Now, if you are, when we are preparing for a presentation, then you get a very short time. So, um, can we adhere to all this? Uh, is there a <clears throat> different? Same principle, same principles, Chandrika. Presentation, yeah. as in you're talking about like a guest lecture or as a resource person, that kind of yeah. presentation. For an uh, annual academic, uh, usually we get about 20 to 25 minutes. And my problem is always I can't cop up with the time. <laughs> so it's not the time. So I try to stick that's to that. That's not an excuse. Yeah, you you write, uh, you, yeah. you know how many minutes you're going to get. Yeah. So you write down everything you want to say. And you find that you can't finish all that in 20 minutes. Then you yeah. go back to the drawing board and tell yourself, okay, out of what I have written down, mm -hmm. what are the more important things? And then you concentrate on those things. Yes. It happens to all of us, right? The first draft that we make, however clearly we plan, will never hit the one 
or 45 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever you're given. Yes. But when you're rehearsing and all that, you find that uh, there are things that you can easily drop because invariably you have put too many slides. You, so mm -hmm. like for histopathology, we cut down on the photomicrographs, uh, we cut down on certain aspects and then you say, you tell the audience, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the prevention of fatty liver disease. I'm not going to talk to you about these areas because I mm. think this is the more important area that we have to focus on. Or in your case, you would say investigations like that. So you, you make sure that though you have been given the topic saying fatty liver disease, you will focus on the area that you think is important. As a guest lecturer, it's easy because you're going as an expert in that field. Mm. Uh, as a postgraduate lecturer, is a little bit difficult because uh, of what someone said. Now, you want to give all the information also to your postgraduates. Yeah, that's the part. So that's why the first question you answer is, who is your audience? and then decide, okay, the audience is this, and this is the purpose of this lecture. The purpose of the lecture is also important. Uh, as a guest lecturer, you are trying to give some new ideas, some uh, recent advances, so you have to concentrate on areas which have those kind of things. Yes, now sometimes usually we have a mixture of uh, postgraduate students, the consultants, now in sessions like we have a mixture, so mm -hmm. uh, you have to be very careful to like. Uh, yes, I agree. It's not quite yeah, easy, uh, but again, they are the postgraduate students are not there to just scan information. Le sessions, lectures, you're going there as an expert, and you have to try and give some new knowledge not yeah. knowledge that is already there. So it's it's kind of, in a way, sometimes easier if you say, I'm going to concentrate on the recent advances of this or something like that. And But then if you have clinicians there, then you can't become too theoretical and laboratory-based. So you have to find a sort of a balance where you relate it to the clinical uh, practice source. Yeah. That you get, sometimes you hit, don't really hit the right target when your audience is very mixed. Yeah, Some people will, so then you have to go with the majority audience. Yeah, that's what, yeah. Thank you, Janaki. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, please wait with us for another few minutes. Uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Tushara Heva Gigana. Uh, he's a joint secretary CCPSL. He's a consultant chemical pathologist teaching his hospital Anuradhapura. Uh, he, he will deliver the words of thanks now. Thank you, Ms. Ali. Uh, let me take this uh, opportunity to thank uh, Professor Janaki Heva Gisenti. Dean, Faculty of Medicine, University of Palenia, on behalf of uh, College of uh, Chemical Pathology, Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, Madam, for delivering this excellent and uh, thought provocating lecture amidst of your busy schedule. And please accept our uh, token of appreciation, which will be sent to you by post. I also would like to thank Dr. Rauchita De Silva, Senior Lecturer, Department of Pathology, Faculty of Medicine, Minister of Halania, for coordinating this uh, event. And finally, I thank all the participants who join us from all over the country. Without you, this event won't be a success. Thank you very much, and see you soon in another webinar like this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.